Holy smokes, they revealed a lot of cards today, so let's just jump into it and do this one with minimal editing so that I can get this video up and not stay up till 5 a.m. editing this thing. Uh, okay, that's, uh, that sounds good, sounds good. Lashana, Omen of Destruction, Portal Craft, Omen Legendary here. 4 play point, 1 4 with Bane, can't be destroyed by spells and effects, can be destroyed by damage from effects or attacks. Evolve, put a destruction in white into your hand. Destruction in white, 10 play point, artifact, amulet, fanfare, put a destruction in black into your hand. Whenever an allied follower is destroyed, subtract 1 from the cost of this card. Can't be destroyed by spells and effects, at the start of your turn, restore 2 defense to your leader. And destruction in black, 10 play point, artifact, amulet. Whenever an allied follower is destroyed, subtract one from the cost of this card. Can't be destroyed by spells and effects. At the start of your turn, deal five damage to all enemies of an allied dis destruction in white is in play. Deal ten damage instead. So it's like an alternate win condition for Portal Crafts. Interestingly enough, it does work with puppets and artifacts both. Not sure which one it works better with at this moment. Uh, but I think as in win con by itself, it's way too slow because you need to reduce the cost of the white and the black. Not only that, the Lashena itself requires an Evolve to even get the Destruction in White, and without the Evolve, it's just a really badly statted follower. 4.14 with Bane that can still get traded up into by an Evolved 2-drop uh, is really quite lackluster, especially in Portal Craft, where it doesn't really have any synergies outside of its uh, Evolve effect. But if you combine the Destruction in White and Destruction in Black together with another win condition, it could work to uh, act as a backup plan. The Destruction in White in the first place, um, restores defense to you, so you can try and heal yourself up while you assemble the pieces for another game plan, for example, Radiant Storm damage. Uh, and then, as a backup plan, if you can't finish your opponent off yet, then you just play the Destruction in Black and it becomes really, really powerful. There's not much your opponent can do about it, so it's kind of like an inevitability win condition for Portal Craft, but again, the fact that it requires an Evolve makes it a little iffy. Uh, I think it's a cool card for sure, like a really interesting and unique design. Uh, I think it has potential for sure, especially if you build around it and uh, make use of your evolve points sparingly to really get the most out of this effect and combine it with other win conditions so that you're not solely relying on this. Because I feel like if you are solely relying on the destruction in black to win new games, you're going to get really disappointed by the fact that uh, Puppet Portal Craft is just going to run you over. <laughs> but um, super cool card, and I think it does have potential for sure. Uh, moving on to the rest of the destruction suite here, we got the Servant of Destruction. Bronze 3.23, Fanfare destroy another allied Portal Craft follower or Portal Craft amulet without countdown, then deal 3 damage to a random enemy follower. So interestingly enough, th these effects, and there are several like this, destroying allied Portal Craft stuff, it actually works with the indestructible amulets that you get from the 1-1 one, one silver we reviewed last time, as well as the destruction in black and destruction in white, which are also indestructible. So you can just target those for these effects and get your uh, 3 damage ping. But still, I think this card is eh. I don't think this card is super solid, um, because you might want to like proc it off a puppet or something, but then you're giving up a puppet that way, and then you can't really trade with the puppet either because of it. Uh, and the random effect also just makes it a little bit worse, and I think there's better three drops for Portal Craft for both archetypes. Like an Artifact Portal Craft, you want to be running Fervent Machine Soldier over this, and for Puppet Portal Craft, for sure you want to be running stuff like Kukuru and, uh, no, Automaton Knight even. Uh, so, not too sold on Servant of Destruction here, uh, but... Who knows, if you can make the amulet indestructible thing work and then just proc it off with this guy. Could be a thing, but I think this is um, uh, the most mediocre destruction card out of the, the whole lot. Uh, next up, we have the Disciple of Destruction here. It's Demon Eater. <laughs> this card is very good. You can proc it off a puppet, and you get your draw off that way, and that's really good. It improves the draw consistency of Puppet Portal Craft, which is really scary, actually, especially since Puppet Portal Craft doesn't lose anything in the upcoming rotation. So we just have to hope that the other classes can uh, make a valiant stand against Puppet Portal Craft, which is, of course, the best, or one of the best decks in the game right now, in rotation format, at least. Uh, but this is overall just really good. Again, you can proc it off the indestructible amulets if you so desire, but I think just using this to eat another, you know, puppet or uh, even artifact if you're going that route, is solid. So this is a really good card. Uh, moving on, we have the Apostle of Destruction here, 4 play point 3, 3 with uh, Fanfare, destroy another allied Portal Craft follower or Portal Craft amulet without countdown. Put a copy of that card into your hand and subtract 3 from its cost. This card is some shenanigans. I think this card has a lot, a lot of potential. You can pretty much imagine any sort of situation where you want to, say, heal a follower up, you know, destroy a friendly... Robomi that's taken some damage and play it again, or 
Uh, I think the most applicable use of this, or rather the most effective use of Apostle of Destruction, is using it to destroy a friendly Radiant uh, artifact after it's already attacked, get a cheaper one into your hand, play it again, and that's a lot of storm damage, especially if you have Acceleradium and um, Deus Ex up already, then you can continue doing bonkers stuff with your play points that way. So I think this is support for the Radiant artifact win condition specifically. You could also do it on um, the, what's it called, the Ancient Artifact, the one that comes back every time. No, that's not Ancient. The um, Prime Artifact, that's the one. And then you'll have two Prime Artifacts if you're going for more Grinder style with, you know, maybe like the Leshenna win condition if you're going for a Grinder style of Warcraft that way. Uh, this card just has so many applications, and I think it's a really cool tech card for a lot of different decks. Moving on, we got the Wind Up spell, two play point bronze spell for Portal Crafts. Put a puppet into your hand. If Resonance is active, put two. I don't think this card is very good. It's a huge tempo loss, I think, for Puppet. Uh, you can run any sort of, pretty much anything else <laughs> to, to not run Wind Up instead. You know, you can take your one Puppet room. You can play more two drops like your Rare Puppeteers. It's, uh, I think, a lot better than a two play point spell that doesn't do anything on the board right then, especially when Puppet World Craft is so focused on tempo, right? Uh, I mean, if you're just wanting to generate puppets for your Leshenna uh, destructions, then that might be a thing, but I just think this is pretty lackluster compared to all the other tools Portalcraft has, at least. And we have the neutral legendary here. 7 play point, 3, 5. Gilden Elise, Omen of Craving. Ambush, Drain, Fanfare. Give plus 2, plus 0 to all other allied followers at the start of your turn. If this is your 10th turn or later, both players draw 5 cards. This card is clearly very, very good for any board-based deck. You just play this. It's kind of like a mini Ector. And uh, that's powerful if you can get anything to stick. And it's also support for, like, Spartacus Sword in rotation. You can make that work. And that is actually kind of scary because you can, you know, build Swordcraft like Swordcraft does and try and curve out. Then you play Gilden Elise and you buff your entire board. And then at the end of the day, you can still have that Spartacus draw thing. Is that going to be any good? Not so sure. But that, again, that's not the only application for Gilden Elise here. Gilden Elise is pretty much pretty solid in any board-based deck. Uh, of course, it's not as ridiculous as Ector is, but I think this has a lot of applications and uh, solid card overall. Moving on, let's not dilly-dally too much. Next up, we got the Servant of Usurpation, 2 play point, one, one Clash, gain plus one, plus one, randomly put one of the following cards into your hand. Gilded Blade, Gilded Goblet, Gilded Boots, and Gilded Necklace. Before we talk about the rest of the Usurpation cards, we need to talk about the loot cards here. Uh, they're tokens generated by Swordcraft's new cards, and it's a whole new mechanic for Swordcraft here. And it's really, really cool, and I freaking love it. So Gilded Blade is a loot card here. Uh, one play point, deal one damage to an enemy follower. And then you can also get the Goblet, which is Restore to Defense to an Ally. Gilded Boots, Give Rush, uh, Necklace, which is plus one, plus one. And those are your four options there. So these cards generate the loot cards, and then the other cards also synergize with these loot cards. I think Servant of Usurpation is really solid as a Bronze Follower. Not only is it essentially a 2-2, because if it attacks into any follower, it becomes a 2-2, right? Uh, but it can also just keep generating value if you're up against, you know, a board of 1-1s, for example. Um, but that's not the best use case here. The best use case is that it's essentially a 2-2 with an upside that gives you more resources into your hand, which gives you a lot of utility. The four treasures are actually quite good. I think the worst one is probably deal one damage, but even then, that can still be useful in a pinch, especially when you're synergizing it with the other cards that synergize with loot cards. Um, and I think to get a better picture of how good these loot cards are, we need to take a look at the other Usurpation cards here. So let's move on. Uh, Disciple of Usurpation, 3 play point, 2 2 Silver. Ambush, Officer. Whenever you play a loot card, gain plus zero, plus one. Whenever this follower attacks, randomly put one of the following cards into your hand. Gilded Blade, Gilded Goblet, Gilded Boots, or Gilded Necklace. So there you go. Another card that synergizes with the loot, gives you loot, and then you can use that loot to manipulate the game state. I love this, especially since I really feel like Swordcraft was in need of a new mechanic to make it more interesting. Uh, this is exactly what the Doctor ordered, and I really can't wait to play with this stuff. I think this card in particular is a... Uh, it works in an aggressive Swordcraft deck, right? It's another Ambush Follower that you can play. Um, not sure if it's better than Tanya, but again, it does have more utility in that it gives you these uh, these loot cards. So if you're running a, a loot deck that focuses on the loot synergies, then this might make it in. So you can build like an aggressive slanted loot deck. These cards are kind of hard to judge because it's a completely new archetype that we've never ever seen before. So we'll have to really just get our hands on it to really decide whether or not it's worth trying out. But I really like this and uh, they get a lot, so this seems like it could fit, again, like I said, an aggressively-minded loot-based deck. 
And moving on here, the gold, much the same way, synergizes with loot, 5 flip on 4 5, so really solid body on curve already. Fanfare, deal 1 damage to an enemy, put 1 of the following cards into your hand, which is the 4 loot cards. And then whenever you play a loot card, deal 2 damage to a random enemy. Bobber. Now this is the money. This card is this card is so cool. So you play this dude. It has an effect on board, even though it's, you know, as small as it is, dealing 1 damage to an enemy. It's still impactful. And then if you built up your loot cards, you can get this guy to stick, or you play it on a later turn, you end up getting a pretty cool board control tool. Especially since the loot cards are really helpful in their own right in controlling the board in terms of, you know, restoring defense to an ally. Um, giving plus 1, plus 1 is super good. Rush really good as well so uh yeah cool card and i think this is exactly what the loot archetype was looking for um it's weird to say that because you know it hasn't come out yet but you know what i mean i think this fits perfectly in what i imagine the style of gameplay for loot cards is like uh so i dig it and finally the most pog champ of all the swordcraft cards octress omen of usurpation 3.23 fanfare remove all last words on an enemy follower and give those effects to this follower? Are you kidding me? Fanfare enhance 8, gain plus 2 plus 2, and the ability to evolve for 0 evolution points, recover 2 play points. Also really good. Evolve, put 2 loot into your hand, which is also really good, with full stats as well. This is just so good, and I think the first thing that people have in their mind is, oh, we can take the last words from our Mordecai, for example. And yeah, that's that's awesome, but you know, when was the last time you saw Mordecai in rotation? It's it, I don't think that's the the most common use case for this card. Imagine even if you're just going first and they play Bellinus and you play Octress, you trade into their one drop with your two drop and then their Bellinus can't trade into you. Or you don't even have to trade, you just take their Bellinus last words and then just smork them. <laughs> and then they have a lot less recovery tools in being able to deal with your board and you can snowball that way. Um, that's like a low impact situation too and that's already really good. Uh, and it's again, on curve stats as well. And the fact that this can remove all last words on any enemy follower makes it so that this has so much uh, application. Like you can you can use it in so many different situations that might be good, and you don't suffer any stat penalty for it. And it has a bonus enhance effect, and it synergizes with loot cards. This card is awesome. Moving on, we have the forest craft cards here. Hornet Soldier, Forestcraft Silver Follower, 5.54, Fanfare Choose, put either a Hornet Warrior or a Hornet Sting into your hand, put both in your hand instead, if at least two other cards are played this turn, and the Hornet Warrior is a Rush Bane for 2 play points, 1-1, one, one. and the Hornet Sting is a 3 play point, deal 3 to the enemy leader. I think this card is, is only okay, seems a bit slow, uh... It does have that flexibility of being either an aggressive card, because you can get that Sting, or a defensive card with that Hornet Warrior, uh, but I'm not so certain this is going to make it into the more refined Forestcraft list, just because it's kind of clunky on 5. I mean, it's an on-curve body, but um, I think Forestcraft's real strength comes from, you know, strength in numbers. Uh, maybe they're changing that with the rotation here, because Forestcraft is losing a lot. Uh, I do think that this card, first impressions, is that it's just going to be alright at best. Um, Putting both into your hand if two other cards are played this turn, that, that comes a bit late unless you're playing zero play point cards, right? Uh, and even then, you're paying quite a price for the other two. Hornet Sting doesn't do anything to the board, which is again why it's so aggressively minded. So if you build your deck around going really fast, and then Hornet Soldier is your fairy driver replacement in rotation, I guess, but the, even then, that's kind of sad. Uh, yeah, I'm not, not entirely sold on Hornet Soldier here. Uh, although it, it is cool that you get the flexibility of being either a controlling card or an aggressive card. I just think it's a bit slow. Uh, next up we also have Bale of the Gleaming Axe, 7 play point 4 4 war whenever an allied follower is destroyed, subtract 1 from the cost of this card. I, th I believe that has to be in your hand for that effect proc, and I don't think that this card is very good. If you think about a card like Eagle Man, for example, it's really hard to really consistently get your Bales. Um, although to be fair, Forest Craft does have a lot more you know, tokens to be destroyed. To reduce the cost of your bail um, and that might get annoying if you have your bail in hand right but this is a pretty terrible top deck and even if you get it down to a low cost it's essentially just a ward body and uh it also gets directly answered by one of the spells that honor of you coming up here one of the new neutral spells so i think this card is mediocre at best maybe i'll eat my words on that one when forest craft is generating gigantic wards and then protecting it behind a 4-4 ward that's very possible i just think that the fact that you have to draw this uh and then also have all your stuff die in order to have it have any effect Makes it, eh. 
Moving on, here's the spell that I was talking about, Craving Splendor, the neutral silver spell for the Craving Suite. Three play point, give plus four plus O to a follower, then deal four damage to that follower. This card is incredible. Three play point, deal four neutral card is amazing. Any class can run this. You can get rid of two, three, 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 one, four stat lines easily. And it also has the application of being able to buff your followers and smack them in the face, which is going to come up a lot more often than you'd think, I think, because I think there's quite a few resilient followers in this set. Um, so this is um, has a lot of applications and is, is awesome. This card is really good. Uh, this card is also really good. Swordcraft spell, two play point bronze spell. Deal three damage to an enemy follower and then put a loot into your hand. Amazing. It's a replacement for Shield of Flame. Uh, it's it's super flexible. There's no you know restrictive enhance cost on it. It can deal with the new three three two three stat lines coming up in this set, and it gives you a loot. What's not to like? Realm of Repose, Havencraft Bronze Amulet, two play point count on two at the end of your turn. If no allied followers attacked this turn, your leader cannot receive more than three damage at a time, and all allied Havencraft followers can't be attacked. These effects last until the start of your next turn. This is, like, awesome. <laughs> like, if Repose is a thing, this card is awesome. Because you're getting all your Repose effects off, and you're preventing damage to your entire board and yourself, meaning that you can go really long games with Havencraft. I'm glad that Havencraft is sort of regaining its controlling identity. This gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, do nothing on your turn, because you are doing nothing, but your cards aren't doing nothing. Your cards are going ham on the board, uh, de destroying enemy followers, dealing damage to the face, restoring your allied followers, all that good stuff. I think Realm of Repose is going to be a key card in Repose decks if that ever becomes a thing. Uh, and it looks like it's it's slanted more towards like a controlling Repose deck than anything else. But man, this is this is good stuff. I'm actually super impressed by the quality of these cards, and it just keeps going on. Last two cards here: Destructive Refrain, four play point Portalcraft Gold. Destroy an allied Portalcraft follower or Portalcraft amulet without countdown. Deal X damage to all enemy followers. X equals the cost of that card. So this works really well uh, on the um, indestructible amulets, especially like imagine this on a destruction in white or destruction in black. That's a 10 damage clear. So if you're going for a grinder Portalcraft deck, then this is definitely going in there. This also works on a prime artifact, which would be freaking amazing. <laughs> like you're dealing so much damage to the enemy board, uh, stalling the game out. And then you can even run this kind of stuff in like a really grindery mill portal craft if you really wanted to. Uh, all these cards give Portal Craft a lot more alternate win conditions, and I'm really glad for that because uh, they're not getting anything rotated out in the coming rotation, so it's good to see that they're uh, getting more tools to make the class more interesting. And I think this card in general is just really strong. Next up, Wings of Lust. Speaking of really strong, Bloodcraft, two play point silver spell. I feel like I'm broken record at this point, but this card is incredible. <laughs> the power level of the set is really enticing. And uh, it seems the, as though the, uh, it, it ties together perfectly well with the theme as well, which I really enjoy. I think this is going to be one of the more interesting sets in a long time, especially because the mechanics are so unique as well, and I just love it. But enough of that, let's talk about the effect here. Wings of Lust, two play points. Give plus two plus two to an allied follower. I mean, come on. That follower gains the following effect at the end of your turn. Deal one damage to your leader and this follower. Enhance four, give drain to that follower. This is bonkers. So... Everyone keeps talking about, you know, turn 6, 6-6 six, six Vera with Drain. And yeah, that is incredible, obviously. Uh, everyone's talking about how this pings yourself for Jormungand and Dark Feast Bat. And that's incredible, obviously. But you can just play this on a one play point follower if you're going first and hit them in the face. It's essentially two play point two two Storm. So if you're going first and you're blood crass, I think you're very, very happy right now. Uh, so I guess aggro is coming back, <laughs> and Rings of Lust is going to be part of that equation. And again, even if you're not playing aggro, it has that use case of uh, Dorman Gun, Darfi's Bat, Pings, and of course that Vira play as well. The giving drain thing, recovering your play, uh, your defense points, and staying alive while you're pinging yourself for Dorman Gun and Darfi's Bat obviously is really good. I actually would have liked to see the enhance effect here be a vengeance effect, because I'm kind of missing the vengeance keyword a little bit. I haven't seen a lot of cards with it lately, but this card is amazing. And we also have the alt art Cassiopeia revealed here, your alternate forest craft leader for this set. This alt art is pretty sick. 
And there you go, that's the unedited card review this time around, because there were so many to go through. And like I said when I was talking about Wings of Lust, I just think that this is such a fun set. All these designs are so unique and so cool, and they give each class a whole new depth. But they're also extremely powerful, which I'm both very optimistic about and sort of cautious about. But we'll see how things work out. Uh, I am really digging it so far. I just, I love it. So this is like one of my favorite reveal seasons so far, I'm not gonna lie, just because so many of the cards have been so interesting and so exciting. Anyway, that's it for this video. Let me know your thoughts about these cards in the comments down below. Uh, make it a bit of a discussion about these new Omen of the Ten cards here. Like the video if you did, don't if you didn't, subscribe for more Shadowverse content and Omen of the Ten hype in the very near future. And of course, thank you to my wonderful patrons, patreon.com slash ignidious. If you'd like to support the channel as well, I would highly appreciate it. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye